the infantryman will always be there. In 1756, the infant American colonies were still tied to the apron strings of Mother England. In that same year, the British found themselves tied up in the knots of a French and Indian war. They hired a mercenary sharpshooting Yankee named Rogers, and he and his band of woodsmen became known as Rogers Rangers. And so the forerunner of the American infantryman was born. Trained he was not, but he was willing to learn. Rogers was a poor disciplinarian but he did set down a list of standing orders that were gems of simplicity. Don't forget nothing. Order number two made sound sense. Have your muskets clean as a whistle, hatchet scoured, 60 rounds powder and ball, and be ready to march with a minute's warning. The Rangers took order number three at face value. When you're on the march, Act the way you would if you were sneaking up on a deer. See the enemy first. But order number 10 sometimes got confusing. And if we take prisoners, we keep them separate till we had time to examine them. So they can't cook up a story between them. Came the revolution, and the book of the American infantryman opened to its first page. He was a bookkeeper. Cobbler, a blacksmith, and a farmer. They called him Minuteman. He lacked training, and his musket was unwieldy. Untutored in the military arts, the civilian soldier walked into a hail of organized fire. Held together by inspired leadership, he retreated when necessary and advanced when he could until we won our independence as a nation. Peace came, but it was short-lived. Three decades later, the citizen soldier was bearing arms in the War of 1812. Again in 1848, when we sent our troops into Mexico and wound up occupying Mexico City. Now we had a standing army. It was still small and untrained, but it was growing. All of these military actions were but a prelude to the thunder of the Civil War. A call to arms was heard and answered. We are coming, Father Abram, with 300,000 more. We are coming, Father Abram, with 300,000 strong. With 300,000 strong. With 300,000 more. The Spanish-American War was a conflict that wasn't particularly large or bloody. More American casualties resulted from disease than from Spanish gunfire. At the Battle of San Juan Hill, Teddy Roosevelt led the charge which broke the Spanish spirit. But it was the infantry that captured the San Juan blockhouse. Throughout the wars that saw America develop into one of the great powers of the world, the citizen soldier reached his maturity as a fighting man. In World War I, he acquired a name. Doughboy. Regulars from the small American army and thousands of new recruits were hurriedly taught the techniques of trench warfare and prepared for combat. While the line was being held in France, recruits were training at home. A typical center of activity was Camp Mills, Long Island, home of the Rainbow Division. The rookies rolled into camp, young and eager. And looking for their great adventure, they found it all right. On the very first day. On the second day, there was more. They put a rifle in his hands. And he learned to use it. He lived in a city of tents. As the doughboys kept pouring in, the tents got bigger. And the trenches grew longer. When the recruits griped about the daily routine, the ever-obliging non-coms varied it. Naturally, all of this outdoor exercise whetted the appetites of growing doughboys. 
To keep them from getting that Logie feeling, they were given plenty of opportunity to work it off. The basic training completed, the men of the Rainbow Division received orders to ship out. They began their great adventure and were given a send-off as old as war itself. Troop transports were filled to overflowing, but nobody complained. At least not so anyone could notice. When they arrived in France, the excitement of the Doughboys was matched by the warmth of 50 million waiting Frenchmen. they quickly resumed their training. The shimmer of cold steel and the French sunshine hit them like a dash of cold water. They realized they were in a war. From now on, they would put their training to use in the trenches. This was the story of one infantry division. But all over the Western Front, the story was the same. Green troops fighting valiantly against a highly trained combat-hardened enemy. But soon the green troops became seasoned. They came fighting men and won the war. It was conclusive enough. Proof that the American infantryman was a soldier to be reckoned with. Nineteen twenty-eight, and the infantryman's training was improving. He learned better ways to set up and administer a command post. He also learned how to save more lives with better methods of handling casualties. And the day was passed when a squad of platoon would execute an unprotected charge across no man's land. Cover and firepower became the rule. Details were worked out for new techniques of deploying an entire battalion on the defensive. To ensure maximum protective cover and fire support, liaison was worked out between airplane observers, artillery, and machine gun fire. 